Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. Today, we have an incredibly rare opportunity to go behind the curtain of two of the biggest product launches in history. I'm referring to last year's launch of the Palm Beach Confidential Newsletter. So if you've been in the Self Made Man audience here for the past few months, you've seen me endorse and promote this publication the last two times that they've opened it up for new customers. So Palm Beach Confidential is the best research publication out there for the cryptocurrency industry. And it's run by a previous guest of the podcast and former hedge fund manager, Tika Tawari. Well, in the past nine months, they've sold over $70 million worth of subscriptions to their confidential newsletter. And the man behind the curtain who pulled that off is here with us today. Fernando Cruz is going to take you behind the scenes, and we're going to break down the most important things you need to know when it comes to holding a massive product launch and the mistakes that you need to avoid. We're also going to dive into my numbers as an affiliate, which is extremely important because it turns out that I have the most responsive list that they have ever seen. In a single $25 million launch last year, the value of my readers like you guys was 700% more than the next affiliate. So why is that? Why is my audience seven times more responsive and valuable than anybody else's out there? And how can you start to build this kind of relationship with yours? Well, we're going to dive into that and much, much more here today in this exclusive interview with Fernando Cruz as we go behind the scenes of their two $25 million plus promotions for Palm Beach Confidential. With that being said, please help me welcome Fernando Cruz. Well, Fernando Cruz, welcome to Self Made Man. We are going to have a lot of fun today, and I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mike. It's uh, really great to be here. Absolutely. So... Fernando, you're you're kind of the the mad genius behind th- maybe the biggest product launch in the info publishing space in the last twelve months for Palm Beach Confidential, which is the crypto newsletter for uh, you know the Palm Beach uh, financial publication. And I thought it would be amazing to bring you onto the show today to talk about how you actually pulled that off. You know, you guys did. Gosh, over twenty-seven million dollars in in your last launch for this product, and you've done it twice now in nine months. You're over seventy million dollars in sales in less than a year for one single product, one single publication under y'all's umbrella. Yeah, yeah where's your yeah? Where'd you come from? Like, where's your background? How did you pull this off? And obviously, we'll get into that in detail. But sure, yeah. So I started marketing online back right around 2000 or 2001. And, you know, basically I was working in just uh, lots of different niches. I never really got into the the make money niche. It felt kind of weak to me um, mm-hmm. to, to sort of, I mean, I wasn't making money online. So, you know, I, could, I didn't want to tell people that I, I could teach them how to do it. And, and it just felt kind of weak to me. So, so I just kind of really for the next, you know, five or six years, I was just really plugging away, building lists, um, I started my first e-letter probably in around 2002, and I wrote every week for about a year, year and a half without ever asking for a sale. And, you know, I was just providing content. And, uh, yeah, it was it was one of those things where it felt or it seemed like this uh, this overnight uh, success. But um, there was all this, you know, there was years and years of just seeding and seeding and seeding that I was doing. And. At that point, I don't know if you know Yannick Silver. I'm sure you do. Oh, gosh. Oh. Yannick was the first teacher, mentor, online mentor I ever had. And I went to Underground 2 probably 10, 11 years ago. Um, oh, wow. Look at that. That yeah, was my, my first internet marketing event ever. And I'm this, uh, this newbie kind of walking around starstruck. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so, yeah, Yannick's a, a really good personal friend of mine. Good, good. So, Yannick has this book called Moonlighting on the Internet. I don't know if you remember it. Sure. Uh, yeah, many, many years ago. And he had he had interviewed me. I mean, there, there's actually a bit of a backstory there with Yannick. But uh, essentially, he featured me in his book because I was in this weird niche, uh, this weird uh, dancing niche, this uh, salsa dancing niche. And 
Uh, we were putting up, you know, some tremendous numbers and, you know, he was really impressed by it. He, he put me, he featured me in his book and that there was some other stuff there that he featured me in. And I think in one of those uh, by mistake, I don't even know how it happened, but my, my, my personal cell phone number uh, was published in there. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was in the book or if it was in a blog or I, I don't recall, but all I know is I, I started getting phone calls from people that were asking if I would help them with their marketing. And um, at the time, I wasn't really interested in it. But uh, there was one particular uh, particular gentleman that had a pretty uh, interesting setup. And, and so I decided to take on my first client. And so as of like, oh, five, probably oh, five, oh, six, around there, I started taking clients. And I built uh, a marketing agency for the next, you know, five or so uh, years. And I still had the, the the salsa site. I sold it off before the big, you know, uh, stock meltdown. I had sold it, so I, it was it was it was pretty good timing. Although it really wasn't affected much by by what was happening on Wall Street, but I kind of focused more on the agency side of it. And then I built up uh, an agency along with some brick and mortar businesses, uh, which uh, I still own today. And uh, roughly five or so years ago, I think it was like in 2013, I was, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine reached out and uh, was was saying that there was this um, this opportunity to do some consulting work with one of the Agora franchises. Mm. It was uh, Stansbury Research and. Originally, it was supposed to be or we, we were thinking about a 90 day sort of test. Let's just, you know, let's see how it goes. And sure enough, that that experience there sort of led me here to to Legacy Research, which is the the publisher for Palm Beach. And so I got into the, the financial newsletter space uh, relatively new. It's been uh, I think it was in 2013 that I got into this uh, particular space. Uh, but that was sort of the trajectory. Um, and, you know, I've just been around the the marketing side of things for a long time. Um, I was building webinars um, in 07, 08. And uh, actually, I was my first few webinars, I was guaranteeing a payout to affiliates because I needed traffic. But I didn't I really didn't have a dialed in presentation. I didn't have a dialed in pitch. And so I, I out of my own pocket, I basically guaranteed and I think it was uh, eight or nine months. I was uh, <laughs> I was basically uh, uh, going negative on every webinar I did. So so I was basically working like a crazy person to not only make no money, but to make uh, you know to 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 uh, tap into my savings. But it was a great learning experience because it kind of built the foundation uh, that I've used ever since, uh, and you know it's it's done pretty well. I did something uh, something pretty interesting. I, you're, you're just talking about how you guaranteed a payment on that. One of the first promotions that I ever did for Palm Beach Letter years and years ago, when Tom Dyson was at the head of the company and Mark Ford, I, I flew down and I met everybody. And it was just one of my favorite newsletters. So I promoted it to my audience. It was $97 a year. And I offered a double your money back guarantee. And I basically said, if you guys buy this publication and you don't think it exceeds your expectation in the next 30 days, not only will you get a refund from Palm Beach, but I'll match what you spent dollar for dollar and I'll send you a check for another $97 out of my pocket. Oh, wow. Nice. And it was a big you know, risk to take. I'd never done that, but I also knew that the publication was great. And we sold, I think, just over four hundred something thousand, four hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of the product. No, I'm, I I apologize. That was my commission that I made. So uh, we sold yeah. much more than that. And Beautiful. I think I may have gotten ten people take me up on the double your money back. Wow, unbelievable! Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. it's it's interesting what happens, right? I think a lot of times marketers and people in our space, not everybody, not everybody, but generally. There's not this this thinking of quid pro quo, and there's and, and certainly not quid pro quo, but certainly not uh, uh, even going beyond the quid pro quo, like making making the other person quote unquote you know more whole than you. And I think that sometimes you have to take those those risks and say, look, I'm going to shoulder this completely. And I think that works when you know you have something that's that's solid. So that that's that's fantastic. I did not know that uh, you had done that. 
Yeah, no, it, it, you know, I think it was a Dan Kennedy inspired <laughs> offer and I was like, oh, let's give it a shot. <laughs> so, well, let's talk, let's dive into and transition into what we're here to talk about today, which is this record breaking launch that you've done for Palm Beach Confidential over the last nine months. And Tico's already been on the podcast twice. Our audience is familiar with him. He's obviously the primary, uh, you know, contributor to Palm Beach Confidential, uh, which is in the crypto space. How did you get involved with that project? Take us back to day one. Were you involved from the very beginning or did they create the product and like, hey, we need a launch and let's bring Fernando on. But what did that look like? Yeah. So um, I was, you know, I first heard about the idea for cryptos and I didn't like it. I, um, this was, this was uh, not, this was like towards the end of 2016. And um, I just remember not liking the idea at all. It felt complicated. It felt like uh, it was it was way too speculative. Uh, from a financial standpoint, I thought that it was going to hurt people. And I saw Tika give a presentation in Miami, and I remember that presentation instantly. I was like, okay, there's something here. And you've spoken with Tika. And and I think that's a huge testament to, to Tika and what he's able to accomplish because he took me from not even a skeptic. I, I was actively thinking, no, this is this is not a good thing for us to do. So I went from there to holy cow, this is money 2.0. You know, this is this is web 3.0. That's how big this is. And so we did a small test. I, my, my general philosophy is you test small and then roll out big. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's too conservative for some, but for me, it's, it's worked out. I know what it's like to have your own money on the line. And so therefore I've always had that approach, that mentality. So we tested it small. It was like a three day campaign in February of 2017. And, um, so I get, you know, this is, this is now March. Um, I don't even think about that campaign. Uh, It's not even on my mind. It's, it was a three day thing. I'm not even thinking about it. And I get these reports and I look through the reports so that I, I, and I'm, when I'm looking through these sales reports, I'm looking for things that we can either reheat or retool or, or just, you know, try to glean some, some insight. And, it caught my eye, this one in particular, because it, it was less than a million dollars that it, it did in sales. Now, normally, normally that wouldn't really attract my attention. And, and you have to remember that one of the benefits that we do enjoy uh, here is we've got a we have a business that uh, these these campaigns, they're, they're larger than than what usual uh I am type of launches are so at a million bucks, you know, I, I looked at the, I, I looked at the at the campaign. It, it really wasn't very exciting, but I happened to glance over at the dates that it ran. And coincidentally, it happened during the week. And so, you know, we usually put the mail dates. So we mailed on, you know, just as an example, the second, the third and the fourth, let's say. And I I noticed uh, when I looked at that, I said, wait a second, this is a million bucks in three days. Uh, You know, this this was not like a full week campaign or didn't have a bunch of affiliates and, you know, all of that stuff. So, yeah, it was nothing. Right. And I look and I said, "Okay, that's uh, it it was over three hundred thousand dollars a day that it that it did. So I said, "Okay, there's something here. So then we planned a a bigger campaign and uh, we did it. We did another campaign slightly bigger. And again, same types of results. Then in April of, of 2017, we did a, a much bigger internal campaign. And this was this was when we decided to, you know, give away Bitcoin. We like we did a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, there, there's a there's a reason for, wh- you know, why I did all of that. But in essence, it was a much bigger campaign. And so then what happened there was that you know, generated something like seven or eight million dollars. And that was a big hit. I mean, that was a really, really big hit. Uh, we did, we ran it again. Uh, we, uh, a few months later, very similar results. And so at that point I said, you know, I think what we need to do is we should do a big affiliate campaign for this. And the pitch, my pitch was, look, very rarely, in, in our space, in the financial space, is very rare where you can where you have a topic 
that affiliates can run with, right? Because most of the affiliates, they can run things uh, that, you know, it's kind of hard to run a, a promo for a stock picking service or or selling options or anything like that. It's not easy. It's not, it's not an easy thing. But I felt that the crypto topic was so new and so uh, general and there were so many people that wanted in and, and, and were, were interested in it and the zeitgeist was all about cryptos that I said, you know, maybe this will work. And so um, that's when, you know, right around the summer of 2017 was when I started sort of planning this launch. And, you know, I did the typical making the phone calls, pounding the pavement, if you will, on, on affiliates. And uh, yeah, it, it, it basically culminated in the November event, which at the time, uh, it was the, the single largest campaign in Agora history. And I remember hitting that and thinking like, wow, this is, this is insane. You know, we just pulled off the largest campaign across all of Agora. And as you know, Agora is like the big umbrella. Yeah, that, they're a billion dollar company. Right. It's a billion dollar company. And uh, they've been around, you know, since the 70s with with some of the most extremely talented individuals you've ever met. Copywriters, marketers. I mean, it's just there's just so much talent in Agora. And, you know, so we're one of the newer and even one of the smaller uh, affiliates of Agora. And the fact that we were able to pull that off was was just so what, what was uh, what were some of the stats? So. This is where it gets kind of crazy, right? Because uh, we registered uh, something something along the lines of a quarter million people registered for the event. So when you say event, let's define that for everybody. Yep. Uh, it was a webinar, a live webinar event that we were gonna, going to broadcast, you know, similar to like a go-to-webinar type mm -hmm. of thing. Okay. So uh, we had 250, over 250,000 people register which just enormous. I, that had never been done before that I know of. We had about 90 to 95,000 people show up live during the event, uh, which again, it, it was just massive. I think the largest webinar I had ever heard of before that uh, was in the 20s or 30,000 mm -hmm. uh, attendees. You know, after all the refunds and duplicates and, you know, all of that crazy nonsense, I think, you know, we had hit like growth, like super, super top line gross number was like twenty five million dollars. But that was uh, there were tons of duplicates and credit card declines and all of that. But uh, I think the number basically ended up right around twenty three million dollars in sales. Awesome. And, yeah, it was we, we brought on something like nine thousand something new subscribers at an average cart of around twenty five hundred dollars, twenty five, twenty six hundred dollars. Yeah, that's um, that's awesome. What were some of the biggest challenges you had with a launch that big? You know, obviously this isn't your first rodeo, but I've got to imagine with any launch, especially one like that, servers are going down. You know, like there right, could be right. all kinds of all kinds of things going on. Well, uh, you know, a server's going down tends to be like a marketer's dream, right? They can they can email their list afterwards. <laughs> right. and, and and by the way, I hate doing that stuff. You know, I really do. I do not like the whole all the servers went down. And so I actually went, you know, the t the team and the the team that we put together was phenomenal. We had a, a, a dedicated technical team that all they did was make sure that we would that the servers would actually be up and running and none of this nonsense. So in the end what we did was we used three different streaming services. We used Livestream, we used Nasdaq, which uh yes, you know, the Nasdaq stock exchange, they there's a they have an arm that that does uh um like broadcasts and, and streams for um for investor calls. And we use YouTube. And then what we did was we had we had the three streams simultaneously going. And then what we had at that point was uh, we had a custom developed player that would essentially switch between the three uh, between the three streams. And so therefore, it was a seamless experience for the user. But in the background, 
it's basically picking the best stream mm. for that user coming on. And then what we did was we had uh, two, we had a, we had the location in Delray Beach, Florida. And then we had a hot spot. We had a, a hot location uh, in Baltimore. And what was happening there was everything we, the, the, the question was, if a Cat 5 hurricane landed right on the building and we lost all power, what would we do? Mm. So that was sort of the thinking behind why we did that. And so, uh, yeah, it was actually happening simultaneously there in uh, Baltimore. And we tested it. It's interesting, Mike. We tested that. So we actually went in and, and just kind of pulled the plugs on the screen. And it took about two. So the user would have seen uh, like the little circle where it's like loading, where right. it's like passing. So they would have seen that little circle on their player. But then about two seconds later, the Baltimore location uh, would have picked up or did pick up the the stream. So it was seamless. Very, very seamless. Very cool. We used Google's, I think it's called Fire something. I forget what it is. Uh, Firebase. Google's Firebase on the page. Um, now, interestingly, the Firebase was used for all the for all the elements on the page. So, like the comment system, little we have like little little headlines and little things that we we we, we would push out and people could instantly see it. Mm. But interestingly, Firebase has a limit of a hundred thousand concurrent users, and when we saw that we were getting so many people to register. We actually had to whip up a second instance of Firebase. And what we did was once we got to 70,000 people on the page, we started diverting traffic over to the second instance of Firebase. And again, what was incredible about this is that it all happened seamlessly. The team was just phenomenal. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how we made sure that we did not have the servers go down. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. That's a, that's a, a lot of neat behind the scenes baseball stuff that you don't hear very often. So thanks for sharing that. Sure, sure. What are the most critical roles to have to pull off, let's say a $3 million launch, which is, it's a big launch, but it's not crazy big like you guys did, right? So what are the minimum critical roles that you need on the team to really pull that off successfully? I, I just want to be very clear. 3 million is, is great. I mean, it's it, a big it, launch. I, I've only done that once. So yeah. That, that's that's our bread and butter. Our yeah. bread and butter is, is a three million dollar, three plus million dollar launch. That's it. That's what we do. These things come in. You know, it's lightning in a bottle. Uh, in, at the time in November, I thought, you know what, uh, this will never be repeated again. I figured that that record would be broken, but it would be broken by someone else at Agora. Uh, little did I know later on, you know, eight months later we would break it. But the the number one, the number one absolute critical vital role is copywriting. You must 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 have strong copy, strong copywriting. If you don't, you're simply not going to. It's just not going. It's just not going to happen. Uh, you know, it's not. It's not going to be as big as it can be. And now, now, granted, if you've been building a, a relationship with a file for years and years and years, you could probably not pay a, a copywriter because chances are that you're so good at communicating with that audience that you don't need you, a copywriter. You're, you're the copywriter, <laughs> basically. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where I think a lot of people don't realize, right? They think, oh, you know, they see guys like Jeff Walker or you uh, who, I mean, you, you know, the, the results that you – put up are just enormously fantastic, right? But you can't do that. You cannot do that without copywriting. It's impossible. And if you're the copywriter, then great. But I, I, I will say you're going to be, be working, you know, all day and night uh, up until the launch. So that's the first key. It, the, I can't under, I, excuse me, I can't overstate how vital copywriting is. No, it's, um, it's everything. And let me let me ask you real quick along those lines. You know, Agora and Stansbury have the best copywriters in the world on staff. I, I believe there's around 40 of them at this point. And if you're in a position where you do not have a copywriter on the team right now and you have to go find someone, do you have any recommendations or can you set some expectations on what would be appropriate from a compensation perspective? Because a good copywriter that knows they're good is expensive. Oh, yeah. 
but and I've never hired one, so I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of people who are listening to this here today, and they need to they need to hire one. What should they What should they promise? What should they put out there as a as a comp offer? Well, first, you're going to have to compete with me, right? Because <laughs> I I, wa- I want my I want to get my hands on every copywriter possible. Uh, but aside from that, um, interestingly, on the comp I, on the comp structure, I don't I don't really have a good uh, answer to that because you know I've got a, a a phenomenal phenomenal copy chief who deals with that um, so I I can't really tell you on the comp side what I can tell you is most copywriters of course they're they're way more incentivized on the upside on the royalty structure so the more uh, the more you can do there the better and. Of course, it also depends on your margins and what you're after, right? Um, I remember a time when I hired a copywriter and I I paid him, I think it was something like 30% of, of sales. And then I remember uh, after everything was all said and done and all the payments were made, uh, I basically said, I will never do that again. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was far too high. So I think it's important that you balance the business objectives along with the with the commission and the royalty objectives, understanding that it is an incremental boost that you get by having good copy. Uh, There's just no question about it. I could point to a number of studies uh, that we are tests that we've done uh, to prove that base compensation. You know, I've seen everything from like a monthly retainer type thing. And then some sort of of, uh, of royalty. So, you know, on the retainer, I would probably say that you would want to uh, sort of credit that against the royalties, right? So, if you're paying X amount of dollars on the retainer, you want to sort of have that against royalties. I think that's that's a pretty fair thing to do. Mm-hmm. I also think that. Some copywriters, the contractor type copywriters that I've that I've worked with, uh, I feel tend to have a good resume, and so you should be able to, uh, you know, request references. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I personally would not place my launch in the hands of any copywriter that I I didn't have some sort of track record for, right? And look, you're in this business for for a long time. You know, if you were at Underground 2, that tells me that you've been around for a long time. So over the years, you, Mike Dillard, right, you've developed this body of work. And it's a body of work that I can point to and look at and and assess. Well, it's the same thing with a copywriter. Uh, there's, There's a body of work that he or she must have. And the results speak for themselves. And so you want that. Don't just take their word for it. Do not just take their word for it because you have a lot of guys who just left some kind of copywriting conference and they, they were, they were told that, Hey, you, you know, this is how you're going to be able to retire and live on a beach and open up your laptop and write from, you know, from anywhere in the world. And that mentality to me anyway, is sort of poisonous. I think, I think, um, the reality of it is that it's it's a job, it's a grind, it's it's hard work. Uh, so you want that person to have that sort of mentality, and so that's what that's what I could say. I don't know the specifics on on compensation. If you're going to hire somebody, um, I could certainly uh, talk to my copy chief and and see if uh, you know maybe, maybe there's a there's sort of a quick little copy podcast that you do. But but certainly as a contractor, I think that would be the the way that I would approach it. Okay, great. So what are the other key roles that you you believe are necessary to pull off a launch? I think you need a, a, a launch slash affiliate manager. There are a, a lot of moving parts. And that person, uh, you really just want them to keep everybody on task. You want the, the copywriters to be on task. You want the affiliates to be on task. The marketers, you want all of those. So I think that role is very important. I also think you need a a connector, right? And, and by connect, so for me, I already had a bit of a Rolodex. So I was able to go out into my network and find people. Uh, but even like that, I still hired a connector and, uh, you need that and you got to pay your connector. In my case, I paid sort of like a flat rate 
uh, plus uh, uh, like a, a uh, percentage override, if you will, on, on, on the sales. Now, that was not deducted from the affiliates that came out of my pocket. And by the way, only a percentage, an override on the sales that that their people bring in. You don't you don't pay them on everything. You right. just pay them on the people that they bring in. What would be a ballpark percentage that you'd recommend? I would say any you know anywhere from two to five percent is is fair. I think now you have to remember when I get into the when I get into this conversation, a lot of times uh, people compare the IM uh, and make money niche. And I've heard some pretty astronomical percentages in, in, in that in those businesses. You got to remember, I never I never marketed in the make money online world. I never did. So I don't I don't know um, how those things play out. What I do know, what I do know is that they tend to want a much higher cut. And, and it's <laughs> I, I think it's crazy. But again, you have to decide what's right for your business and you have to you have to take the health of your business as the number one priority because if at the end of the day you put all this work and you generate 5 million dollars and your margin was 2% and you kept nothing you know what what good is it i mean that's a grind that you can never get out of and uh, so that's really really important that you consider the health of your business before being uh, you know I, I don't want people to to get desperate and, and kind of go for any deal just because they want a sale. So, so that's one. And I think also how you structure the deal is very important, right? If, if you have a connector, how long do you pay them on the people they bring you? Some, some folks, they feel like, Hey, I should get paid forever on this. I, I disagree with that. It's, you know, if, if I go to Google and I pay Google for an ad that generates a customer, I don't pay them forever. Right. So, but uh, maybe th- there's a very high quality connector that that says, well, you know what, I'm worth it, and I'm going to bring these names to the table. And I think you can you could attach some performance to that, but uh, it's important to make those things clear right at the outset. No, I think that's great, and I've always heard of two to five percent for an override for an affiliate manager, right? So an affiliate manager goes out and they bring on ten big affiliates that are going to promote your launch. That affiliate manager is going to get two to a two to five percent override on all of the sales that those ten affiliates make. So just to kind of be clear on that for everybody. So yeah, that's totally, right. totally agree with you on that. And I think that's, I mean, that's kind of it, right? The affiliate manager who can also be a project manager. You've you've got tech, which is necessary as well as we've we've obviously talked about. And that just from previous experience, I don't know if I've ever had a really big launch go flawlessly. Where the oh. tech just worked fine, right? I've learned the hard way. You've got to have servers that scale. You've got to call your server company and your hosting company ahead of time and say, "Hey, we're going to be getting ten to twenty x the normal traffic per hour." And I've had launches where the pages literally won't load, and yeah. you're just killing yourself because you know, like these people are coming here to buy, and the page won't even load. <laughs> and it's it's just such a big mistake to make. But you know, lessons learned the hard way. I tell you, one of the, 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 the a great solution to that is uh, something we did, which I, I think probably about six weeks before the launch, maybe a little bit more, we were basically meeting on a weekly basis and we were load testing uh, different parts of the funnel. And we actually discovered a lot of things. For example, it's not only the, the servers, right, but the databases, right? So you have a database that's that's sort of managing what's happening on page. Then you've got your CRM. Then you have the databases that it uh, is is sort of writing to. Then you've got your credit card processing and, and your gateway and your payment gateway. And then those things have databases as well. And so what, I, what we discovered or what I discovered was, you know, it wasn't enough to load test the connection to that particular piece of the puzzle. It's not enough to test the connection to the web server or the gateway server or the the, the server that's serving up, you know, your, uh, your, your stream. You also have to go deeper and, okay, how does this server work? It, you know, what's the database that's driving it? And then you have to load test that thing. And uh, yeah. so it was... It was good that that we had the time to just test, 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 and of course having a good uh, uh, tech team that can that that was uh, investigating these things was was very helpful. And this might be a little too technical for folks, but put this in the back of your brain when you need it. 
what you're saying is is absolutely right, and we've run into that trouble too. When let's say you've got one database, whether it's your email service provider like MailChimp, or you're using Infusionsoft for your shopping cart, or your credit card, a wish list member, whatever it may be, and all of these software services need to talk to each other, and you're essentially pushing data between them via API calls. Right. Now, what you'll learn the hard way at some point is that one of those services might have an API limit of, you know, 50 calls per 10 minutes or five calls per minute or something like that. But you're now pushing through 100 entries per minute during your launch. And all of a sudden, they're not going through. <laughs> People exactly. aren't getting their receipts. They're not getting their passwords. They're not getting access to what they bought. They're getting super pissed. And you would never think about that. So I want to give everybody a resource right now. On the tech side, we use visiontechteam.com. And I've been using them for probably four or five years now for all of my tech stuff. Uh, all of the launches, they they service a lot of the other big internet marketers out there like Yonic Silver and and those guys. And they just know exactly what they're doing. They've literally been through 100 different launches. They know the tools that you need, the software that you need. They know how to make them work. They know how to, that they need to call the hosting company. They know that you need to call your merchant ac- account a week before and give them a notice and say, hey, we're probably going to get 10 to 20x the sales volume that we normally get. And if you don't do that, well, you'll find out uh, unexpectedly that your merchant account all of a sudden stops working or they put a hold on your funds and put them all in reserve because they think it's fraud and they're not going to release those funds for three to six months, which means you're super screwed because now you can't pay your affiliates. <laughs> so, exactly. um, yeah, it's, it's a lot. And, and I'll tell you, we could never cover the gamut of, of everything that you have to consider, which is why planning so far ahead and is, is so important. And you need to have the time for the tech side. Like we were meeting weekly just on tech. That's it. Nothing else. Because the last thing I wanted to do was have all these uh, affiliates trust us and send us all this traffic and send it to blank pages. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. 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 So one of the one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about real quick are the the stati- some of the statistics that you had for your top affiliates, right? What are expectations that you can set around that? Or I don't know what anything. Man. Really. Yeah. So if you're doing, so here's the thing, you should never do a launch unless you've tested it and you need to be very clear on what those testing parameters were. So in my case, we were testing it to an internal file. Um, and even though we had run the, 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 uh, the campaign two or three times prior, I was very clear, look, this was a house file. This is how we did it. This is how this list promoted or, or, or uh, behaved. This is how that list behaved. It's very, very important that you have those stats because when you talk to your affiliates, you want to be real. You don't want to make these numbers up and you certainly don't want to pad those numbers. You don't want to do that. You'll never get, you'll never get another shot. You'll never get another shot and, and it, it'll be gone. You will be persona non grata and you wouldn't even know it. So you have to be very meticulous. So if you did a a, a small little test to your list, having hyper personalized emails and you were able to achieve, you know, an $80 uh, or not 80, let's say $50 per registrant, then you say that, except you give the context behind that $50 per registrant. You say, look, This was my list receiving emails from me. This is how I built it. Because if you're not clear on the context and you're like, oh my God, I got this thing that's paying you, you know, 150 bucks per registrant you put on. I mean, that's just this BS. There's no way that that's the same number throughout. I'll give you an example. I hope you don't mind me sharing some of your your results. Oh yeah, no, go for it. So for the November event, your efforts yielded a result of right around $250 per person registered. For the webinar. So for, for the webinar, right. So for every person that registered through your efforts, those people that you put on the list, you generated $250 worth of revenue. Okay. Now, you actually came in uh, in third place, which, I mean, again, it was just phenomenal. 
you were not far off from second and even first place, actually. Wow. But the difference, the difference was that the first place winner, their revenue per name on the, on the per name registered was something like $37. Mm. So, so you've got this huge diff. I mean, that's a huge variance, 37 versus 250. And so the reason I bring that up is because you yourself, if you're testing it to your list, you're going to have very different results. And it's important that you manage those expectations. So sure, maybe you did get a $500 per registrant thing, but you know, you were probably building that list for six months. You hadn't pitched them anything. And the day you decided to pitch them, you pitched them a nice offer that, that converted pretty well. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen again. So you have to be very, very clear with the affiliates and you have to be very clear with what kinds of uh, expectations they, they should have. And so that's how I did it. I, I used real numbers and I was very clear on what those uh, uh, on what the numbers meant, like the context behind the numbers. Yeah, no, you just have to be you just have to be completely transparent with folks. So I'll take the other side of the table real quick, right? I'll take the affiliate side instead of the business owner side. I only promote, let's say in the last year, I think I've promoted three products. Okay. Uh, y'all's, were, y'all's was one. And that was that has been the most successful affiliate promotion I've ever done in my entire history, right? I'm very transparent about that with my audience. I believe I did around $1.3 million in sales from that and uh, 590-ish thousand in commissions, which is a hell of a you know, <laughs> a hell of a way to make money for, for, you know, sending four emails and taking two hours out of your day to send four emails over the course of a week and, and making 600 grand. Not too bad. You did one, one podcast or something like that. Yeah. yeah. One podcast and four emails, uh, was the, the campaign. And, you know, our audience is not crypto, it's entrepreneurs. So I had no idea what to expect. I was like, I'm passionate about this subject. I'm a customer I actually paid for you know, the publication six months prior as a, as a consumer. Uh, so I knew the product and I loved it. And I was like, ah, maybe there's an interest in, in my audience for this, uh, you know, crypto information as well. We'll see what happens. And clearly there was, right? So, right. you know, the, I think that just goes to show we're always talking about here that the money is not in the size of your list. It's in the relationship that you have with the people on that list. And I'm pretty sure that I had one of the smaller lists out of, let's say, the top five affiliates, maybe the smallest. It, it was definitely the smallest, yeah. But, th- by, but 8x in value per subscriber, basically, or per click over everybody yeah. else. So that just goes to show you, right, <laughs> uh, that yeah. the, the, the money is in the relationship. And so I think that's super important. And then, gosh, what else from... From a launch perspective, something else that you guys do that I think is really important is when it comes to actually paying your affiliates. And you've got a very specific methodology that uh, I'd love for you to share everyone as far as how you break the payments up into, I believe, three parts and when you pay them and and all of that stuff. But could you dive into that side? Yeah, um, I I think we did a a little bit differently on this one, but generally we do three to four payments. The first one is within two weeks. And I think we do like like half, half fifty, of the, yeah, fifty or sixty percent, pretty quick. I think yeah. I think we change it up a little bit, but I think it's like within two weeks you're going to get paid half of your commissions. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was something that was really important to me right from the beginning. I wanted to pay the affiliates quickly, and then basically every thirty days after that, you're getting more money uh, up until. I think the third or the fourth payment, and the reason why we kind of take that approach is just to account for any refunds and chargebacks and things like that. But the bulk of the the money is paid for, is paid out within uh, two weeks, and then uh, it's thirty days uh, after the the webinar. Mm-hmm. So really, your next payment is actually two weeks after that. So you get a payment in two weeks. Then it's another two weeks later because of the the way the the thirty. I think I think that's how it is. I'm pretty sure that that's how I do it, but it doesn't matter because the, the point is that within the first month to month and a half, generally speaking, roughly 70 plus percent of your commissions have already been paid to you. Yeah. And so it's really, really fast. Yeah. And that's, and that's important. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Like 
you know, for me specifically, if I take seven to 10 days and I dedicate my efforts to promoting a singular product offer for seven to 10 days, that's time away in an opportunity cost from promoting my own products, which would be showing up every 48 hours through my merchant account, right? So that's a big, that's a big piece. You don't want to make your affiliates wait a month to, to see a return. And a lot of affiliates, I don't do this, but I know a lot of affiliates buy media. They buy ads and they're willing to essentially hedge their bet by buying traffic and, uh, and spending money on that. So they're going to be billed for that and they're going to want to cover those costs. So Absolutely. Cover the cost and also a return. Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. Man, I'm trying to think of what we haven't covered yet, but we've covered a lot. I want to emphasize real quick the copywriting piece around what you mentioned earlier. As an affiliate promoting another product, that's part of the reason I only do two or three promotions a year. And as of right now, uh, it's the same three products and same three offers because I know that the marketing launches and the funnels convert. So there's you guys... Uh, amazing selling machine, my friend Matt Clark here in Austin, who has a phenomenal Amazon, you know, kind of distributorship program. They've done some monster launches as well, you know, well, $10 million plus launches, uh, probably nice. for the last six, seven years. And then, uh, and then another one in the kind of the real estate niche, which has been a new, a new offer, a new product this year. But again, I've gone through these products. I love them. I see value in them. I know the quality will exceed expectations. But most importantly, the the marketing converts because if it didn't, then none of this is is there, there's no point to any of this. We shouldn't be having this podcast. <laughs> no, there's just no point to it. Like if I'm going to spend relationship equity and time to promote your product, and if you didn't do your job on the marketing side and convert those visitors into paying customers, it doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve my customers. It doesn't serve anybody. <laughs> so uh, that's really the big the linchpin for all of this. And if you get the marketing and the copyright and you have some great conversion rates, then the rest is really just a technicality and making sure that the things continue to run smoothly. Exactly. Exactly right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Fernando, we've, uh, we've covered a lot. Is there anything that you think we haven't uh, talked about yet that's a critical piece to pulling off you know, these monster launches that you guys have been doing? No, that, that's basically it. And just, you know, just be prepared for a lot of work. They do require a lot of work, mainly because if you decide to do that, you're no longer responsible for yourself and your employees. You're now responsible for uh, all of your affiliate partners, so just make sure you do right by them, and and that uh, you you you've set it up so that they are successful. The more successful they are, the more successful you are. And it's a pretty easy metric. No matter how much money you made, we were going to make more. And so having those interests aligned that way means that I want to do my the utmost to make sure that you're making more money. And so that's sort of the, 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 the only sort of parting words that I would have. And then I think one more critical piece that we probably take for granted that unfortunately I've seen some other people abuse is if I'm going to send you my best customers, don't F with them after the launch. <laughs> yeah. Don't abuse that, right? Like I'm going to send you my most valuable, responsive people. I'm going to endorse your product. I'm going to do my best to sell it. And then unfortunately, you'll see people who now have this fresh list of all of these webinar attendees and customers, and they'll immediately go turn around and a week later start promoting just garbage to them. That's right. Yeah. And again, that's a mistake if you have a short-term kind of desire to just make money and you don't really care about the people that you're serving, nobody will ever promote you again. You'll be blackballed and and that'll be the yep. end of your career. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a one-hit wonder. That's a that's perfect way to become a, a one-hit wonder. And yeah, I, I guess uh, that's true. The, the 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 final piece is fulfillment. Making sure that what you're fulfilling to that end customer uh, is fantastic quality work. And I mean, we have an entire editorial department that that's all they do. All they do is is worry about the fulfillment. So yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Fantastic. Well, Fernando Cruz, thank you so much for taking the time to to take us behind the curtain, if you will, on one of the biggest launches in history. And congratulations. You guys have 
just killed it. Uh, you know, again, in the last nine months, over 70 million in sales of this one single publication, which is just, it's unbelievable. Um, yeah. You know, I haven't really quite seen anything like it before, but you guys have definitely put in the work. You all have the skills. And once again, the timing is just right for what you're doing. And the interesting part with the crypto industry, I think the next, you know, the next big wave and the biggest, uh, the biggest one is yet to come. So, absolutely, who I agree. knows? Yeah, your third launch might be uh, might be the biggest uh, out of them so far. So, it, it could be. It could be this this uh, last one we did with uh, with Glenn Beck. Uh, it happened in a in a market that was down eighty to eighty five percent, and we beat November, which is crazy. I gotta say, I gotta say, I was very concerned about that. Where I almost emailed you guys, and I was like, I just don't think the timing is with you know this offer right now. And I was yeah. like, I would hold off, you know, until the market turns around. And that's what I'm thinking. But y'all had, I don't know if you just had faith or you threw caution to the wind and were like, screw it, we're going for it. But yeah, yeah. the response was bigger than last time. Yeah, yeah. We, we actually beat the record. I think I told you, I didn't think that, I didn't think that the November record would stand very long because I feel like once you hit, hit it out of the park like that, when, when a team inside Agora does something like that, um, it, it tends to get replicated. And I, so I, I really thought it was, gonna, it was going to be beat rather quickly. It, it has not. And then we came along and beat it. And I had no idea that, that it would be us. And what I, what I could tell you is why we decided to go move forward actually could be a topic for another podcast because it's very, very interesting, the thought process behind uh why we decided to do it when we did and yeah I'm, uh, I, is it i mean i think T tika's mentioned it once and maybe there's another reason besides his but from what i saw he's like look i'm predicting the market's going to start it's going to bottom around july and it's going to start to recover in the fall and we want to get all of our new subscribers into these, you know, these picks, crypto picks, essentially at the lowest prices that we can, so that they can, you know, experience the biggest gains. So that's the reason that I saw. I don't know if there was another one behind the yeah, scenes. I, from, from an editorial standpoint, absolutely. The, and and again, this is why it's important to have a subject matter expert that that knows what what he or she is talking about. That's that's definitely the the, the big editorial reason. Uh, I, I think it also breaks down into. Th there was some work that was done beforehand to to sort of make sure that we were positioned properly. Uh, but really, it all boils down to on the editorial side, you know, does, does Tika believe it? And that's a huge, huge portion of it. That's absolutely right. Very good. Very good. Well, where can folks reach out to you if maybe they're a big influencer, they have an audience, they're into crypto, maybe they want to participate in the next launch or for other purposes, how can they get in touch with you? So I've, I've been meaning to get my own URL for this purpose. It's been happening a lot more. But the easiest way right now to reach me is uh, you go to facebook.com forward slash Fernando Cruz. That's facebook.com forward slash Fernando Cruz. Cool. Well, who's we got to look up who owns FernandoCruz.com and go after him now, right? <laughs> yeah. I, some guy, I've actually reached out to the guy before and he's never... Uh, He's never responded to me. So, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Someone used to own MikeDiller.com, and it took me five or six years to get it from them. Oh man! And I once a year would send them a little email. They weren't using the site for anything. It literally just had their email address on it. And every year, I'd say, "Hey, are you willing to sell?" And finally, after the market crashed in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I was like, "I don't know. Maybe he's hurting." And I offered him, I think, five, three to five grand, and he finally said yes. And there you huh. go. So, <laughs> you know, I should have I should have taken advantage back in 08. That's that's a good that's a good point. Well, it's only a matter of timing, right? <laughs> so you'll have you know yeah. you'll have another this, shot. This next uh, this next crash is going to be big, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll wait for that time. There you go. Well, Fernando, <laughs> thanks again. I appreciate the time. This is an awesome conversation and some really neat insights into uh, to what you guys are doing over there and. Uh, thank you so much. As always, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. If you loved this episode, please go to iTunes, give us a five-star review, and leave some positive comments for us. That helps us out tremendously when it comes to helping to spread the word of the show and getting it seen in the search results in iTunes. So I would appreciate that a lot. And I do read all of those comments. So thank you so much. We will see you next week.